Okay, here we are. And Amor by Nicole Krause. Alice, go ahead. Yeah, I, I have to apologize in advance. We, I've got workmen here and it's very noisy in my house. But anyways, um, I, I, I had to step away for a minute, so I missed some of the discussion. But in terms of, I, I almost felt like it was, I mean, because she said that, at, you know, she, okay. part of it is at the turn of the millennium, you know, in 1999. And so then it's forward from that. So I was thinking it was kind of science fiction-y. I mean, that it was like way in the future, kind of a dystopian kind of thing, which I I mean, this goes along, I think, with what other people were saying. I, I did, I liked the love story part of it. I thought it was interesting, but I I didn't really understand how the two came together, you know, how that whole thing in the refugee camp, wherever it was, how that added to the the story of, you know, the love story part of it. So I have a um, Lynn. I have a question. What love story? Oh, there was a I mean, big uh, what, what, what she was the, her relation her relationship with Ezra was um dysfunctional it was a relationship it was a relationship and i think she talks about relationships rather than love um and i think that the narrator i don't we don't know his name um uh, loved her as well and he treated her i mean he cared for her in the camp but i'm wondering if, if the whole question is what is love and um, not that there is love in, the, uh, I, I, I don't know. I did not feel that there were loving relationships necessarily. So somebody tell me when you say that you love the love story, where, what love story are you talking about? Elaine. I think she was looking for love and trying to figure out what love is when she said that he didn't take care of her. Right. She was talking about the man who I can't remember his name that gave her his coat. And she realized that she was not in love and that he would not take care of her. So that was, I thought, very interesting. But again, I was totally thrown by it was like two different stories, in my opinion. And, and I didn't get the connection. And I meant to read it again if I could get the connection, but I didn't. Abby? Yeah, I, I really had a hard time with it for this very reasons that everybody is saying that. But then in the middle of the night, it occurred to me because I was really <laughs> struggling with, with the camp or whatever. But then I thought, oh, maybe she was in a nursing home or some kind of a rehab place, you know, feeling like mm -hmm. a prison or a camp or whatever. Um, in terms of the love story, it reminded me of somebody that I, you know, was in an organization with um, at one point, and she said she felt that a woman needs three partners, a romantic one that you fall in love with, one that you raise your children with, and one that you grow old with. And that's mm -hmm. what I saw in different scenarios. <laughs> in so... I am always amazed when I Google you know, that specific reviews come up, not just on Nicole Krauss, on every story. Yeah, yeah, and, I found that too. Right, and I was so confused by the refugee camp. I, and I had to keep going back, like, is this a flashback? But and when I read, I, I have two things to read to you. I felt 100% better. <laughs> if Krause's trademark privileging of the past works its way through these stories, <clears throat> it's enlivened by a new interest, flashes of the future. Like the fires burning in end of days, come hell or high water, the mysterious pandemic warning and future emergencies or the never explained refugee camps of Amor. <laughs> and as soon as I read that, I'm like, oh, yeah. All the more eerie for their references to an all too recognizable New York. 
Images of various dystopias introduce a forward-looking anxiety that penetrates and disturbs the general sense of a suffocatingly heavy past. And here's one more. Um, what puzzled me about Amor was the setting, one of the refugee camps. Um, they are in, they're in a place of grievous suffering is made vivid enough. But if there was a good enough reason to use it as a backdrop for a love story that did not in any way require such a setting, I could not see it. The use of both the refugee camp and the gas masks. And I, you know, you remember the gas yeah, masks. The gas masks. Mask. Something about these other stories, but you remember that. Mm -hmm. um, seemed to me like examples of the hook that writers are often encouraged to sink into the reader's mind with their opening sentences. Uh, Judy. Um, to be honest, um, with all of the um, bombings and glass breakings at the temples around uh, in Skokie and the shooting in Texas, there was a moment when I got the chills and thought, oh my God, this could be the future. Um, so I found it prescient, but fri terribly frightening. Yeah. Terribly frightening. Mm. And I'm sure she wrote this before the pandemic, right? Oh, yeah. So oh, yeah. Um, it's, it's um, it, 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 that part of it becomes um, just even more frightening because look what happened. <laughs> Lynn? So the, okay, so let's say it's a forward looking, let's say that. Yes. Um, to me, the word refugee camp, okay. My mind went immediately to Israel, but I guess I it doesn't have to be Israel. Um, right. But in what context would the word refugee? I mean, he she could have used any other kind of camp, but the, and there's refugees all over the world. Somehow, maybe she's displaced. I don't know wherever she is, she's displaced. I don't. I, that was confusing to me, and I'm. Um, I, I would like to explore it. I mean, somebody here said use dystopian. Who said that? Alice. So Alice, what did you, when you said dystopian, what well, made you say that? Well, the reason I said that is I think it's clearly in the future because she's the, oh, it, yeah. the story starts, I, you know, with the narrator saying, I haven't seen her in, in decades, I think in it decade. said. Decade. Right. Okay, and then in the story, there's talk about 1999, you know, 2000, you know, the change of the millennium. Right. It has to be way, way like, like the 2050s or the 2060s. Um, so like the future, but, but not that far off in the future, right? Like our children and grandchildren will be living through it so so i mean that's why i thought it was and i and i figured it was the united states because that's what it didn't seem to me like they were going anywhere else so that going along with what judy was saying it was kind of creepy because you know thinking like oh my god this is this is what she's thinking our world is going to be like in the not too far right. Doesn't that guess, suggest I, that there's somebody who's taken over that made her a refugee? Uh, I don't know, but you know, again, what, what what I, you know, for a short story, you know, it's just a short story. It's just a few pages long. It just seemed like she's talking about the future. And then she's talking about this, you know, woman and her relationships and you know what she's looking for in a love partner and so i'm just thinking to me that's like two different stories but that was okay. just me yes um also the disturbing details that she had bald spots that uh, that was disturbing to me because does that mean you're hungry you're not getting enough vitamins and like, you've been abused yeah or you've like, been abused how about right. a nuclear? How about nuclear? How about well, nuclear? I didn't think about that. It's just nuclear getting worse war. As we're discussing it. Well, and, I mean, yeah. If you want to push it way into the future, think about. I mean, if you've ever read *The Road* by um, 
McCormick. McCormick. Yeah. Um, there's a desolate, you know, desolate landscape and everybody's gone. So I, you know, I mean, there's a lot of that pushing into the future. I think I agree with everyone about the coherence is not for me is, is lacking in the story. Um, I love the part about, I love the part at the, when she talks about uh, the guy with the coat and, the, and, um, and noticing your partner and listening to your partner and all of that. I mean, there's definitely um, a message there, but does it take this destruction to make us realize what's important and what our priorities are? I, uh, maybe, I mean, look at, the, look at the pandemic. It certainly has made us more conscious of um, who's important in our life and things like that. I don't know. And, and I think because of where we're all sitting, we're on Zoom, we've been on Zoom for two years, we're going into our third year. I think it's even more emotional that, you know, here she's talking about, I, I also thought it was a dystopian type um, setting. And, you know, that's just frightening. Go ahead, um, Elaine and then Lynn. I have a question. Does she die at the end? And she dies at the end. So <clears throat> was this story written around 9-11? Or, I mean, I, I don't know. It was written after 9-11, right? Okay, yes. so that, that could have been in her mind. And I, I mean, it's just, you you could put all of these theories into place and, and make a story out of it. But I mean, was it a remembrance of hers or, or was it a remembrance of his? And, and are they going backwards instead of forward? <laughs> so the, the interesting thing is, is that her ex-husband, who I believe this is a, uh, it's not, what's the opposite of a love note? A hate note. I, I mean, this is like, <laughs> this is something to the husband. <clears throat> he had a lot of success with everything's illuminated. And I think he's got another, you know, yes. screenplay or whatever, all about 9-11. So obviously that was a big, big thing in the household. Um, so, and I think it goes back and forth. Um, I, I, you know, it, it, it takes place, it takes place, I think in the future and it references the, it references the, the past because nine eleven's in all of our past, uh, Lynn. I, is the other Lynn, did you raise your hand, Lynn? Oh, Lynn White? No. Okay. No. Um, I'd like to get people's opinion about this narrator. Honestly, I, I can't, couldn't tell if he was being authentic or for years being sarcastic. I mean, he said, by then I had stopped fantasizing about her, I suppose. And then he talks about, it felt good to be useful, good to be able to make things a little bit easier for her. I, I just suspected his, he, he wants to feel hero-like here for her. And I think he's, he was upset that uh, if you look at this was interesting. I may be overblowing this. On 137, he's talking about weddings. And I, I from what I gather, he didn't get married, right? I, I don't think he's married. Um, in my comings and goings through the camp, I would pass the medical station, the hall with broken windows where weddings were still performed. The guy who cut hair and the one who hawked containers and the handyman in a turban who worked in the shade of an archway, who would take a broken gas burner or heater and with a little sideways nod of his head would always say, tomorrow is good to the owner, impatient to know when he or she could return for it. S sometimes parts of the camp became flooded and when the water was gone, there would be impassable mud. But I would always come back to check on Sophie and bring to her what I could. I don't know, I thought the idea of his putting weddings in the midst of all this broken stuff and 
this low life stuff and mundane stuff. Um, he, I don't, th if it's, the story's called Amor, I think his perception of relationships is, is um, pretty negative. Um, I, I'm just gonna throw this out there and then Abby, I wasn't sure that the narrator was a man. Really? Yeah. Um, and I find they don't name the narrator. And I have found in a lot of these stories, I am confused of, of, with gender, that she leaves it very, Nicole Krause leaves it very amb ambiguous. Abby. Yeah, that's, you were running, I was running the same path. I really had to mentally tell myself, wait a second, the author and the narrator do not have to be the same gender because I was visualizing a woman as a narrator. And for the first oh. stages, I thought maybe it was, you know, a um, lesbian type of a uh, yes. situation, but uh, meandering um, and, and thought. And then when I realized sort of that it was a male and it, I, I just had to make that transition. Um, and I don't know if that's something that I normally assume that, that I don't normally make that transition, which I should, that the author and the narrator are different. Yeah, I, I, I think I agree that that's what happened with me. And then, then, then you start questioning yourself as you're going through and it, it gets it, you know, it makes it more confusing. Um, so um, another thing from a review I read said, the potent figure so familiar to us from novels, a difficult egotistical father makes several appearances. Seeing Urshadi is a strange and evocative story that while straining credulity manages to ring emotionally true. And another less convincing one, Amor, we are asked to believe that one of the characters can recall every detail from dialogue to camera angles <coughs> of numerous movies she saw decades ago. So, uh, yeah. What puzzled me about Amor was the setting, um, one of refugee camps, you know. I, oh, I read that already, so. It, it's, I, and, and this, um, Judy, and then Joyce. So, is it possible that she could be warning us that, you know, the lest we forget concept, um, that here, it's doomed to be repeated if we don't do something about it. And it has something to do with love and compassion and understanding other people. And I don't know, just a thought. Yeah, yeah. Joyce? In terms of gender, Vanessa, I had the same thoughts. I thought that the narrator might be a woman also. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are, so, there are more questions than answers in this story. There are so many things that are thrown at us that are never resolved. Yeah, yeah. That Alice, are, um, Alice and then Lynn. No, I just was looking at something um, on page one. I was trying to see if there were hints about whether the narrator was a man or yeah. woman and it says on page 133 um what are they talking about um they didn't have they broke up Ezra and Sophie broke up and then uh that the at midnight drunk and feeling ruthless she turned to the guy who'd been talking her into the wall me oh and killed him mm -hmm. oh, okay there thank you Alice Mm -hmm. <laughs> and okay so and see now that you know um he would he got along in the refugee camps by i don't know plying his wares i don't know lynn go ahead no i my my response is that i don't think it matters if it's a, a, a lesbian relationship or a heterosexual relationship it's talking about relationships and the idea that if people don't listen to each other 
and notice each other in our, you know, I try to come up with a definition of love um, from the story. And it, uh, to me, it's being attentive to the needs of someone else. It's, it's not self-absorption and it's, it's not egocentric. It's noticing, noticing people and listening to people and being thoughtful. I feel our society is so far away from that concept of, of love, love for thy neighbor, um, the polarization. And, you know, so many stories are written about um, the end of the world and, and how that happens. And if, it, you know, if we read it, the paper every day, you get really distraught about that. Uh, you see us heading in that direction. And so I think this is the refugee camps. I, I agree. I think it's a forward looking concept there. Uh, though this, this guy, um, actually, you know what? This is, third, it's not first person. This is an omniscient author an omniscient narrator. He sees into, they met in New York, um, right. starts out first person, and then it get, goes to omniscient. So mm -hmm. I think that's interesting. The end is, is first person too. And the end is first person. So what do we make of that? Abby and then that. Elaine, Abby. I think what Joyce just said a couple of minutes ago just was a, a wake up moment for me about looking for resolution. And I think sometimes we forget that life is in the middle and we're always looking for a beginning and end, a resolution, things to fall. I know I'm always looking for things to fall into pattern. And I'm, I, I can't like, my husband can start to watch a movie in the middle. There's no way that I can do that. <laughs> and unfortunately, when we used to go to movies decades ago, for some reason, as soon as it would get dark, I would fall asleep for those first five minutes when the whole setting and I, what's happening, what's happening. But <laughs> in terms of any kind of a relationship, things are always in the middle of somebody's story. But in reading this, yeah, I was looking for resolution very much. Um, and this, um, oh, Elaine, go ahead. Then I have one hey, more. Thing I'm just throwing this out. It's an idea that I just thought of. Could the camp be symbolism and not an actual camp? It could be. I, I mean, it, it, is it her, the marriage to falling apart from her marriage? Because there's something always in her stories about her life. So I'm just throwing it out there. Um. They all in the notes, this um, woman said this device um, of, you know, the hook of the refugee camp and the gas max, that device can serve a story well, of course, but since Krauss never engages with the difficult reality of either of these extreme situations, the hook ends up dangling like an upside down question mark. And I, that is, this, this reviewer is Sig, Sigrid Nunez. And I, I agree because I kept focusing on what is the refugee camp because, and I had to go back and find the timeline and I'm sure that's not what she wanted us to focus on. And I, I, mean, I think you are right. That there's a little bit of her in all of this. Um, and I don't know if she was, were they, were they ever married or did they just, I don't think they were married. No, they oh, never they just married. broke up. Yes. Right. Yeah. I wasn't there when her end came. I was standing in line somewhere or searching for a connection or looking for water or waiting. And it's, I, I mean, it's not very hopeful, right? There's, no. It's not. Yeah. Um. Not that the other ones are, but um, this one. You know, this this line at the end is sort of what Elaine and Evie are saying. Uh, the absurdity of believing that the decisions about who we love and who we bind ourselves to could ever be arrived at rationally. 
Yeah. Or are yes. assuming that we would be afforded a fair or natural death? Or did she mean the absurdity of having once believed in the possibility of dedicating one's life to anything beyond tomorrow, beyond just surviving? Or just the simple long-standing absur absurdity of having lived a beginning that bore so little relation to the end? That is probably definitely her marriage, right? Yes. It, it's it's not only her marriage, I think it's life. Yeah. Uh, you know, like we don't live in a, we don't live in a linear world. Our lives are not linear. Um, and there are resolutions. We just keep moving forward, solving one crisis after another. And um, I don't know. I like Elaine's interpretation. I'm wondering if life is one big refugee camp. Where oh people are trying, people are trying, I know, Alice. but wait, about oh people, people, think about it, people from different places trying to make connection. You know, I, I just read a short story book by Alice Picard, and I think that's how you pronounce her name, and the stories were so uplifting and so sweet. <laughs> Even though at the end her best friend died, these stories have all Wait, now I don't have to read it. <laughs> a, a negative down uh, personality to them. You know, I mean, I thought this other book was like, oh, that's such a sweet story, and this was nice. And you know, she is absolutely a very troubled soul and working her life out in these short stories. So I think we have to take that into account and not always figure out how, like Lynn said, things do not necessarily make sense. They could be symbolism or autobiographical, how she sees things and because they have no connection. There's really no connection. Between this, what do you mean? No connection between? Between the, the camps and, and the love story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so it could be a symbolism and, and she's feeling angry about the breakup of the marriage or-, or It wasn't a marriage. Huh? It the wasn't her marriage. a marriage. Her marriage. Oh. Her about the author. Marriage. Her right with a little tinge towards the left or the the unhappiness because she may be very unhappy. You know, I think we have to take these things into account of who the writer is. I agree with you. And on page um, 140, <coughs> the movie, which she um, they recall in such detail, which is hard. Like my husband can do that. I cannot do that. Um, it was in French, a story about the private life of an old couple, retired music teachers, code for writers, um, who have been happy together for a very long time. They go to a concert and the next morning she has a stroke. Um, I, I think that that vignette, the more I think about it, um, like she's not going to grow old with, you know, the father of her children. This is the section I read to Gary last night. These several starting on 140 and going through 142. And I have to say that this to me struck such a chord. It's such a universal kind of narrative about marriage and thinking about it, especially as you get older. Um, <laughs> what happens when you become infirm or disabled and, and who's there to nurture you and care for you and, live, and help you live your life with some dignity? Um, I think this is Krauss ruminating about, I find this a, her very, very personal part of the story and I guess we just have to grab what it is from the story that appeals to us because I don't think this is the best structured story this I don't know where this 
was when this was written, when she was putting this collection together. But I have to say, I saw this movie. That, I don't know if any of you, did it sound familiar to you about no. it? No. It's an elderly couple and yeah. she gets- she There gets was a movie foreign, about, all about Alzheimer's a, a few years ago that had, a, the wife had either she was, had some sort of dementia and he took care of her. There's, there's been many, many books. There was a famous author, which I can't remember now, whose wife also had dementia. And he talked, to, he wrote a book about taking care of her. There's right. a bunch of stuff. Well, this one, I remember they were sitting at the table eating breakfast. And That's all the movie sudden, I'm talking she about. She went, I think she had a stroke. Yeah. That's that what it says in the book. Yeah. I do remember it, and it was a heart-wrenching movie. So it, yeah. that spoke to me as well. Um, um, I don't know. Yeah, Alice. Yeah, um, this goes on top of what Elaine and Lynn and I think Evie were all saying. But um, you know that last, the second to the last paragraph of the story, where it's asking all those questions about the absurdity of this, the absurdity of that. You know, it made me, I went back and looked at the story and there's a, I think you were even saying this, Vanessa, there's a lot of details about their lives. And also there's details about the parents, like the mothers were both from Europe and right. went to religious school and one didn't. I, what The point I'm saying is that I think Nicole Cross Prouse is almost saying, well, Yes, everybody's life is made up of all those things, you know, who your parents are, how you're raised, where you're raised, but in the end, does it matter? <laughs> you know, it, it probably were all, and this goes to maybe what Elaine was saying about the refugee camp being symbolic, you know, wherever we all start, we're all ending up, I guess, in the same place. I mean, it's kind of disturbing. <laughs> We're all ending up in the same place. Maybe we're all ending up in that refugee camp. <laughs> Alice, <laughs> Judy. Um, you know, I, I was reading this story um, and they, she talks, gets to the point at the top of 141 where she talks about the couple that's been married over 50 years and the woman becomes an invalid um, and how kindly her husband takes care of her. Well, this last year, I've been married 54 years I ended up not being able to walk. And my husband had to do everything, cooking, shopping, <laughs> grocery shopping, which he hated. Um, and I'm past that, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very lucky. But I read that and I thought, this is what I expected from a, a person that I would marry. And she found this so amazing. Um, and it made me realize, boy, I should be damn grateful. <laughs> because it doesn't happen to everybody. No, and, right. Um, so that part of the story really resonated with me. Yeah. It had a huge impact. And, and I said to my husband, I'm, <laughs> I, I had always said, thank you every time you did something for me, but I turned to him and I said, I'm reading this book and I'm really, really glad I married you. <laughs> you know, in um, talking about those, I, 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 um, I wrote a note. Gary, um, I put here superficial similarities. And I think what Krauss is saying is when you are searching for a mate or when you are exploring possibilities, it's really the character of the person that you need to um, take into account. My grandmother, who was in her 90s um, when I was dating Gary and I was dating another guy, and she said, does he have potential? <laughs> this is my 90-year-old grandmother. And she said, does he have a woman in every port? <laughs> and then my mother said, look at the way the husband treats his wife. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about Gary's mother. So, you know, the things that we look for or our kids look for in mates, uh, the emphasis 
I have learned, and I talked to a, um, a daughter of a friend of mine who ended up in divorce, and she's and and my friend saw the writing on the wall, never said anything to her daughter, and I said to to this young lady, if your mother had said anything to you about him, would you have listened? And she said, you know, I would say yes. I would have listened, but I don't know if that's true. I don't know. And somebody else said that another daughter of a friend of mine whose marriage lasted less than a year, um, the mother said, this was not good from the beginning. And, and she said to her daughter, she, the daughter said to her, did you see that this was gonna happen? And her mother said, yes. She said, well, why didn't you say something? She said, would you have listened? So, that's the, the issue of, and I think this is the story, um, disregarding everything else, brought to mind, and I agree with Judy, I thought it spoke to me about what is love? What kind of love um, do our kids look for or we look for? Do they look at superficialities? Um, so I think, and if anything, I mean, no, I do think this is the best story. That part of it uh, spoke to me. Um, I <clears throat> low these many years of being in congregational life, you know, sometimes we have to work with families where there's been a divorce and now there's a simcha, bar mitzvah, b'nai mitzvah, or wedding. And I look at the couple who's divorced. I'm like, how did you ever get together? Like, I, I, it's like, it's so plain to me and, you know, okay. It's been 13 years or 15 years, but I, I, it never ceases to amaze me. Okay, Judy and then Elaine. I think that's one of the reasons that young people today are, are getting married much later. They're yeah. waiting to see, both to see their per own personality develop and the personality of those people that they're with develop because I think they're smarter in that regard. Um, I got married when I was 20 and I met Roger when I was in high school. So it's for, for our generation, it was a different um, right. equation. And, and maybe somewhere in this story, although I haven't read it for that regard, um, there's a message about understanding yourself in order to understand who you are. That's a good point. Yeah. Right. Um, I also think that this generation, they are getting married older, but um, if they live together or whatever, sometimes they break up and I say, it's like a divorce. They oh, yeah. have a house together. They have things together. They have pets together. Um, for yeah. the most part, uh, you know, they don't have children together. And so, you know, it, just because they weren't married, it's still, um, it, it's, you know, so tragic. Um, Lynn and then Elaine. Statistically, people who live together before they uh, get married have a higher rate of divorce. Really? Because, yes, because they have put invested all of this time and effort and all they've got all this stuff together and they say it's just too much of a bother to break up. We're just going to stick it out. Mm. And so ultimately, it just doesn't work. Lane. Okay, I think this group looks at stories because of our ages, and we're all similar ages, differently. Getting back to this happy short storybook, I was thinking my oldest granddaughter and I sometimes share books and recommendations. And as I'm reading this, I thought, well, this might be good for her book club. And then I decided, no they would not see it the same way we view things. We view things as everyone does through our eyes. And our eyes have been married for a long, long time. And, and we view things differently. And, and as far as the younger people getting married, I have a, a granddaughter who's getting married this month who has been with the guy for 12 years. And I have another granddaughter who was with a fellow for three years and they broke up. You don't give opinions. 
anymore. No one listens to your opinion. Trust <laughs> me. Okay. You say, hmm, interesting. Oh, <laughs> and that's all you say if you want to be on good terms with everyone. But you you have your private opinion and you better off keeping your mouth shut. No. Years ago, I our mothers would say to us exactly what they felt and our grandmothers would. Nowadays, you don't say anything. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that, Elaine. Yes. And because the kids are older uh, and because they're, uh, you know, they're not babies going into marriage and buying a house and all those different things, you know, it's just different. It's yes. so, so, so different. What well, we but, were talking, I'm Lynn. But you know, Nicole Krause is, how old is Nicole Krause? I'll let you know in one we minute. Know. I think she's in her um, 30s. Maybe 40s. Really? You know, and I have to say also that sometimes when we're dating and engaged in our she's early- She's 47. 47. <gasps> Whoa, I didn't expect that. Yeah. I and gonna be 48. Know in August. <laughs> I, I think that she, she displayed a lot of wisdom in this story about what she expects, but she may have gotten that after the, you know, after her divorce. Two, I'm reading a story now called Writers and Lovers. Has anyone read that? Do you like I, it? I love it. I'm really enjoying it. Did you like it? No. No. Loved it, Alice? I love that book. I, you know, I'm thinking love about that book. book as we're talking about love and what you're looking for. You know, she is, she is, I'm not finished with it yet. I have to, we're doing it next week. Um, you know, she's looking at different guys and what they would bring to a relationship. And, um, and so I sort of disagree with Elaine. I think young people, and this girl's 30. I mean, that's not old. Um, I mean, for us, that was old. But for them, <laughs> for them that was, that's not old. <clears throat> but I mean, certainly younger than um, 60. Yeah. Um, but I think um, people are not getting married so early because there's, thing, there's not a lot around. <laughs> <laughs> that meets their expectations. <laughs> My you know. grandmother got married at 27. She was wow. old. Yeah. old. Yes. And now if you said blah, blah, blah is getting married, they're 27. Oh, that's so young. <laughs> I Alice. I got married. I was 31 when I got married. So I, that was all of my, virtually all of my friends were married. Most of them had kids by the time I got married, which was great because they all babysat for me, all those kids. <laughs> no, but it, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, listening about, yeah, it, you know, I, I think being older, you know, it was, what do I want to say? It, it just was, I think I knew more what I, what I wanted, you know, it was, it was just, um, you know, I had gone through my 20s being single and, you know, seeing what was out there. <laughs> I think so. it's called maturity, Alice. <laughs> yes, right. right. <laughs> it's called maturity and seeing, I don't know. I think our age, our, our country is really self-absorbed. People are self-absorbed. I mean, they're very much centered, self-centered. And bringing that into a relationship is not good. So um, you have to be, I, I don't know. I think a lot of women are choosing not to marry too. Agreed. Agreed. Um, here's one more piece. One of the most unsettling pieces tells the story of a dying Jewish woman born and raised on the East Coast of America. It takes place in a refugee camp in an unnamed country, which could be the U.S., in an alternative reality or imagined future. Through the narrator, we learn of Sophie's lost love, a love she abandoned for reasons which in the scheme of all that has occurred and of her impending 
lone and lonely death now seem insignificant. Do you think she wanted to be with him at the end? I don't be with that. Ezra. Be with Ezra. Yeah, absolutely not. Yeah, because uh, he wouldn't bring her a cup of tea. Hmm. You know, that it's not only after. it's not only then he said she he never realized that she was cold. Hmm. I mean, she never he never. I mean it. Going back to when she was cutting the bagel. Oh, the bagel incident. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. He was oblivious. Oblivious. Yeah. Good word. Yeah. I'm Elaine. I think I'm getting more and more tied into the symbolism of the refugee. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I think that she was looking for love and the gas mask is a barrier for intimacy say so i'm really getting into the symbolism of this and, and i i'm gonna hold on to that so that's, that i understand this story a lot more for me okay. and, and that it doesn't matter where the refugee camp was it's all in her mind and she's still searching because Miss Cole Cross being as young as she is is still a marriageable age and could still be searching and I find a lot of her stories have this nugget of autobiographical in them if we dig a little bit so that's my story <laughs> I'm sticking with it okay <laughs> okay yes <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, the other thing, <coughs> excuse me, is that this woman says <clears throat> that people want to see a full length novel from her. That all of these stories are like tidbits. She yeah. has written a no she has written novels. Oh yeah, oh. but she I'm her last one, I think was Forest Dark. And oh, that book is super hard. Yeah. And the more I've read about it, I <clears throat> I might start it again, but it's very dense. She's a very dense writer. She is. But yeah. she, isn't it interesting? She wrote The History of Love. Yeah, yeah, I love that. So she's consumed with that concept, I think. Yes, yes, yes. Um, she also wrote um, The Great House, which was also right. lovely. Um, yeah, so Forrest Dark. No. So it's Vanessa, hard. why didn't you yeah. like writers and lovers? <laughs> I just thought the woman was too, she was always the victim. And why couldn't she just make a stand and decide for herself? Maybe, she, you know, uh, the antithesis of me, like I just didn't, she, she let things happen to her and I didn't get that. I, my girlfriend loved it. And who's the writer of that? Um, Willie King, I have it right here. Yeah, and she, interested. she has a new book out. Euphoria? No, uh, author of Euphoria. Maybe. I don't know. Well, yeah, you know, I, I did. I didn't like it at the beginning, and then I got into it, and I and it's really for me compelling because she's got all these guys in her life, and I can see, don't go for him, and you know, I'm, I mean, I, but I can't talk. All right, how old? Can't talk to her. <laughs> <clears throat> how old do you think she is, Lynn? The girl in the book? No, Lily. Oh, King. Lily King. I have no idea. Do you know? Yeah. How old? You, you guess, and then I'll tell you. I would say she's probably in her late 30s. She's 59. No. <gasps> <laughs> what do we do before the internet? Well, um, I, <laughs> I, yeah. you know, I just have to comment on the writers and lovers. I, I loved it because I thought she did such a fabulous job. Uh, and I read this a long time ago of explaining what it meant to be a waitress <laughs> and in that no she just I mean I just 
felt like I was that person. She just did such a fabulous job of explaining that whole whole life. And then I, I don't even I remember how it ends, but it was don't just like tell me. don't tell me. No, I'm not to. But for me, it was like, oh, she should pick this guy because of this. Oh, she should pick this guy because of this. It was like it, it made you think about well, what's important? What is important? Just like what Nicole Cross right. was doing. Right. Right. What's she has a new she has a new yeah. book out, Five Tuesdays in Winter, and it came out in November. Okay. Also, if people are interested in writing or, or writers, the process of writing and the difficulty of publishing and the agony of, of going through the process of writing and um, trying to mesh those two lives of having a personal life and trying to write um, because writing is such a absorbing, you know, life right. absorbing process. And so the, I, the uh, book, the book we read last month for my book club in the evening <coughs> was by Joshua Hankin, um, Morningside Heights. And it's, oh, about, yeah. it's gotten great reviews. Um, it can be triggering because not unlike the movie, it's about um, a man. It's a relationship in the man who is a professor has early onset on Alzheimer's oh. and how that plays out and who takes care of him. Alice. Yeah, just going back, just to bring writers and lovers back to the story that we're talking about. I mean, I felt writers and lovers, it was similar in terms of like, you know, what's important in finding a life partner, but in a in a much lighter, I mean, this was like, our story today was like so dark. I, you know, I don't know, necessarily think that that subject has to be put into such a dark light, but probably in light of what Nicole Krause has gone through in her own life, that's kind of how she sees things. Yeah. yeah. I have to say bye, yeah. bye Sue. Oh, bye. Bye. Two okay. weeks, <clears throat> two weeks in the garden, Great. in the garden. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Good to see everyone. Stay Are inside. You know, I'm going to try to come to these. I don't know if I'm, I won't be here for the next one, but I will try to. We're leaving that day, I think. Okay. But I will, I'll have my iPad and I will, it's going to be a different time. So it'll be eight o'clock in the morning, I guess. Oh no, it'll be nine. Wait, where are you going? Where are you going? California. Oh, California. oh it'll be eight. Eight. Yeah. yeah. That's so, your good soldier, Lynn. If you get up that early, you get extra points for coming at eight. No makeup. <laughs> I had a speaker. I tried to get a speaker for adult enrichment at 10. She goes, yeah. oh, no, I can't do it. I live in California. It would be eight <laughs> o'clock. I said, okay, and we're done. She goes, eight can you move it? I, is said, not, no. I mean, like, that's the latest I get up here. I mean, I'm oh, up no. early, so. Yeah. All it's right. Really up early. It's great, Lynn White. It's good to see you. Good to see everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.